Welcome everyone. My next guest brings us through her journey of faith as she tells us about meeting Jesus for the first time. Betty Lacey was rushed to the hospital with severe AFib symptoms. So join us and she'll tell you her miracle story of someone who just showed up unexpectedly. And on the last day, the pastor was there and he was telling everyone about Jesus. And he said, if you would like to know Jesus and have Jesus in your heart, raise your hand. Well, I was the first one to raise my hand because I really wanted to know more about that. And he had, a, uh, he had another girl and myself come up front after everyone left to talk to us. But when we got up there, he just said, okay. He said, uh, we can baptize you Sunday afternoon. There was no counseling, no prayer, no nothing. You know, I went up there wanting to know more about Jesus and how I could get to know him. And instead, I got, poof, you're a Christian. You're a believer. So that's the way it went. I thought I was a Christian because he said I was. Now, my mother started going to church not long after that, but... Neither one of my parents were believers until just before they passed away. And as time went on, I continued to go to church and Sunday school and do everything that, you know, that a Christian girl was supposed to do. And as one friend of mine said, I was doing Jesus things without Jesus. And after two children, I had gained quite a bit of weight. And we were doing a weight loss program called Way Down with Gwen Shamlin. Mm hmm and on week six of the one that we were doing, she did a talk on the when God took Ezekiel through the temple and showed him all the rooms and everything that was going in, on in there. Mm -hmm. Well, that was an analogy for the heart mm -hmm. when you really look at it that way. Mm -hmm. And he was showing all these things that I had hidden in my heart. Mm -hmm. And that night I just sat there and I said, that's me. Mm. That's really me. So I went home and I couldn't sleep. About 11.45 that night, I got down on my knees beside my bed and I asked Jesus into my heart. And I knew it was real then. I knew it was real. I woke my husband up and I was crying so hard. He didn't know what happened. You know. The next morning when we went downstairs and I was, he said, you going to tell the boys? And I said, yeah, I'm going to tell them. Mm -hmm. And so they were sitting there and my 14 year old started crying when I told him and you know the other one he was sitting over there and he was hooping and hollering and everything else but I looked at Scott and I said honey what's wrong and he said mom I can't say that he said that same thing happened to you happened to me I can't say that I believe Jesus and my husband said son do you want to and he led him to the Lord that morning before breakfast on Sunday morning, when we walked the aisle together, that was my first testimony that I had given besides with my children because the pastor looked at me and he said, could you tell your story? And I said, when? And he said, right now. There were a thousand people there. <laughs> yeah, it was a big church. <laughs> it was a big church. And so I got up and... I gave my testimony. I told exactly what happened and wow. what all had been going on. Baptist invitations could go on for a long time. <laughs> and I was praying and I had my eyes closed and I was hearing things. You know, I was hearing people talk and walk around and things. So I didn't look up. I just kept praying. And then all of a sudden the music stopped. Well, when the music stopped and I opened my eyes, there were people everywhere. They were across the altar. The lady who played the piano was talking to a pastor and crying her heart out. And that morning, 27 people wow. came down and said the same thing had happened to them. Betty, talk to us about God's extraordinary grace. Oh, this is the good part. I really love it. Jeremiah 29, 11. God has a plan for my life. I like to personalize scripture. Every scripture that I read, if there's a pronoun in it, I change it to my name or me or I or something like that. But God had a plan for me. 
and he revealed it to me in the most unusual way. In 2002, I was diagnosed with atrial fib caused from congenital defect. Began taking medications, could not take them. They just made the condition worse. I can, stayed in AFib most of the time. I have been shocked or, recon, or converted 38 times. And that's almost a record <laughs> you know, as far as that goes. God had a plan, and it was part of his plan to get me to where he needed me to be. Because I have a problem. I like to get ahead of him, but he didn't want me to get ahead of him this time. He wanted me to wait on him. So he had to slow me down, mm -hmm. basically what he amounted to. That morning when I woke up, I was not doing well. I knew I was an AFib, but it was different. And unless you've been an AFib, you really don't know. But my heart was racing so fast, there was not even a way to describe it. We tried taking my blood pressure, and it kept coming up error. There was error, error, error. And, there, and my husband would take his, there was nothing wrong with his, it would come up. Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, after passing out two or three times, he said, okay, he said, we're going to the ER. Mm -hmm. And on the way to the ER, it really, got bad. I could see the hospital from where we were and then all of a sudden everything went white. I could hear my husband say, just hang in there. We're, you know, he said, we're just a hundred yards from there. He said, just hang in. And I couldn't, I thought I was talking to him, but he said that I wasn't. And all I could hear besides him talking was a gurgling. Yes. Yes. Uh, by the time we got to the ER and he got someone out to help me, uh, everything was totally white. I could hear people talking, but I could not see anyone, anything. I was trying to answer their questions, but they couldn't hear me as far as that goes. And it wasn't like it was an out of body experience or anything like that. I was aware of what was going on around me. They got me into a room and there were two nurses in the room, a male nurse and a female nurse. And my daughter-in-law was also a nurse in the ER, but she wasn't there yet that morning for her shift. And they were, t they hooked me up and one of them said, I've never seen anything like the, an AFib like this. And the other one said, it's not AFib, it's VTAC. And then all of a sudden they said, we need a crash cart. And when I heard them call for a crash card, I thought it was for somebody else. So I was praying that for the person that they were calling the crash card for. Well, then there was a doctor who came in and he was, you know, trying to get me to wake up. Well, I can hear you and I can talk to you, but you're not listening to what I'm trying to tell you type thing. Yeah. And he said, we don't have time to give you any drugs for this. He said, we're just going to have to go ahead and shock you. Oh. And he said, it's going to hurt. And he said, like, and I can remember him explaining everything to me. Yeah. And uh, they shocked me. And everything you've ever seen on TV, when the people come up off the bed, that's exactly what happens. Oh, boy. It was, it hurt more than anything. Well, they had to do it seven times. Oh, no to get me before I convert. I was not resuscitated. I was not resurrected. I was resuscitated. Okay. That's what it amounts to, even though everything was white. But during that time when they were working on me, mm -hmm. all of a sudden a peace came over me that I'd never had before. And I said, Lord, if I'm dying, I'm ready. Mm. I'm yours. I'm ready to go right now. And I said, whatever you want me to do, whatever you need me to do, let's mm -hmm. go. Yeah. And just before they shocked me, this someone touched me on my shoulder. Hmm. And he said, everything's going to be all right. God's not through with you yet. And the person was standing behind me. I even knew where he was. He was standing behind me. And that's when the peace came over me. 
just complete and total peace. Aww. And after they shocked me, you know, and I woke up. I didn't know you could get that many people in a room as far as that went <laughs> because they already had a surgery team from the OR down there, and they were all standing in the room waiting to take me to OR if they needed. Oh boy. Me. And they had my husband in a room, family room because the doctor was prepared to tell him that I had died. She oh. thought I was not going to make it. And she said, I don't know how she made it, but she did. He said, by the grace of God. Amen. But when people started leaving, I looked at the nurse who had been in there with me and I said, where's the man who was standing behind me? And she said, what? I said, where was the man who was standing behind me? She said, what do you mean? And I said, there was a man standing behind me. He put his hands on my shoulders and he told me that everything was going to be okay, that God wasn't through with me yet. And she just looked at me and she said, that was your guardian angel. Aww. She said, Miss Lacey, no one can get behind you. Your bed is against the wall. Yeah. It wasn't like you know, most of the ER rooms, you can go all the way around the bed, but this one was up against the wall. It was a very tiny room. And I looked before I left the room that day when they took me up to ICU, mm -hmm. and there was no way anyone could have been behind me. But there was. They told me that my heart rate when they hooked me up was 333 beats a minute. <gasps> Your heart, oh. a heart start, stops beating at 300. After that, it just flutters. Oh. And that's what happened when I started, whenever, when I was hearing the gurgling, that's when everything, the blood was not going anywhere. Oh. My heart was just filling up. They took me, they were going to take me up to ICU, but when they got up there, there were several people in there with the flu, and they said, no, you don't need that after going through this, so they put me into a private room and stepped down, and lo and behold, a lady who worked for me at one time came in, and she was my nurse, and she was a very, very strong Christian, and she came in, and she said, what in the world have you caused to go on down in the yard? She said, I've already heard about it. She said, tell me about your angel. You know, and during the next five days when I was in there, Jesus was in there. He was in that room. Aww. My husband said he could look at me and he could tell when I was talking to Jesus. He said, because it would be different. He said, I could tell when you were arguing with him because they kept me asleep most of the time. So I wasn't awake to where I knew what was going on. But when he said, I'm not through with you, you have a ministry and that ministry is with women. And I said, okay, how are we going to do this? You know, and he started planning it out and he was told me, he said, you're going to get a website. And he said, the name of your ministry is going to be heart and home ministry because the heart is the home and he said you're going to minister to women through that and i said okay and i said but how am i going to get a website because everything is heart and home you know i've got a calendar that says heart and home there's a tv program heart and home <laughs> and he said you're going to get it you're going to get it you're going to set up websites you're going to set up all these things he said you're going to do this and he said and you're going to start working with women Okay. So he just kept giving me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, this is everything that you're going to be doing. And so my husband, when a couple of days later, I was talking to my husband and I said, God told me I need to be in women's ministry. And he said, okay. And my husband is a teacher, so a Sunday school teacher and a deacon. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, he told me to get a website. And he said, you can do that as long as it doesn't cost more than $25 a year. I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, so he brought my laptop in, smuggled it in, and I started, went to GoDaddy, and they had a sale that I could get two years of a website URL for $14. <laughs> I said, can we do that? And he said, yeah, you can do that. Uh, you probably were very excited at that point. <laughs> and it's heartandhomeministry.com. Beautiful. 
you know, it was right there the entire time when I questioned God. He was so far ahead of me. Yes. I just couldn't handle everything that he had for me. If he had told me everything that was going to happen to me over the next seven years, I would say, there's no way I'm doing this. There's no way in the world I could possibly do all this. But because of him and what he's done, I have done things at my age. I'm 72 years old. You look beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> but I have done things that 30 year olds couldn't do. Really? I, because they have families and okay. they could not afford the time. I have been to conferences. I have been to uh, women's leadership. I was the 2018 city coordinator for the Beth Moore conference in hot springs took up 13 months of my life. We had over 5,000 women attend. Wow. That's great. And I've met all these people that I have admired for so long. And just, you know, when you think, just to be in their presence sometimes, you know, like Jennifer Rothschild and Beth Moore and Lisa Harper and, you know, all those big guys, you know, I've sat down and I've had dinner with them, you know, <laughs> and I'm not bragging. It's just something that's happened. But a couple of years ago, he sent me in another direction. The okay. same direction, but with di something a little bit different. Okay. And uh, I'm working statewide with the Women's Ministry Network through the Arkansas Baptist Association. Okay. And uh, I have eight counties that I work with women who are involved in women's ministry. If they have problems, if they want to set up a women's ministry, they call me. I work with them try to get everything straightened out, you know, what all they need. If they need anything, I'm their point of contact that they can have. And that's been a blessing there. But also, I have started writing devotionals and different things for a ministry called My Journey of Faith. And I am president of the board of directors for that now and working with my beautiful friend, Sandra. Sandra, yeah. Who I love. Yes, and I also saw where you had one of our other board members on there the other day. You had yes. Rebecca on. I love yes, Rebecca. Rebecca. <laughs> oh, and that ministry has meant so much to me, and we are working so hard. But it's a worldwide ministry for women. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, so tell me, tell me a little bit about the ministry that you do with the women right now, one-on-one -on -one or grouper okay. that's my it's what i call my ashes to beauty group we had our church originally was one of the co-founders of what's called Re recovery point ministry and it's a let's just say it's recovery it's a recovery center for women who are in addiction not only addicted to drugs and to alcohol but also we always have some, we don't always have someone in there, but in women who are involved in human trafficking. There are usually nine women at the house. They come to my house once a month for dinner. Mm -hmm. And I mentor them and walk them through what they're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, how their life is going to change when they come out of the recovery. Mm -hmm. And they're so, it's evidently the only way I can ever describe this ministry, the mentoring part of it. It is the most rewarding, the most loving, the most kind, hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. Mm -hmm. You invest so many hours in prayer, so many hours with them one-on-one -on -one or in a group mm -hmm. you know their heart you know their soul you know their mind mm -hmm. and occasionally there'll be those who don't make it through the program that they'll leave for some reason or other because the draw to the addiction is more than they can handle at the time mm. those are the ones that break your heart um how how many 
actually go back to it. So if, like you're doing a ratio of how many people stay and how, and, and continue through the program, get out and start a life. And those that revert back to what they were doing before. I'd say over half, mm. over half. Some might take a couple of years before they, you know, go back to the addiction. Mm -hmm. Some never do. Mm -hmm. We have had some success stories that are absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our success stories, and I always tell her, and I said, you were the worst of the worst. Because I was there the night that she came in and she was still in detox. I was at the house that night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was awful. <laughs> that was the only way to say it. But now she is the director. She's graduated from college. She's in the process of adopting a baby, her and her husband. And she was the director of a halfway house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She is a success story. And then we have several others that are. Mm -hmm. Some may make it two or three weeks into the program before they leave. Mm -hmm. Some may make it almost to the very end before they leave. Mm -hmm. We never know. We never, ever know. There was one not long ago, and I looked at her and I thought, if she makes it, it's going to be strictly by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's been by the grace of God that she has. She's, she's been prayed for. Yes, she has been prayed for many, 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 many times. Yes. And uh, all of our girls are prayed for, as far as that goes. But, you know, it's just, they want to, they were separated from their families while they're in recovery. Mm -hmm. They're separated from their friends while they're in recovery. And it's when they get back, when they get out, they're back with their friends again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've had some call, Miss Betty. I need to talk. And mm -hmm. I say, okay, what are you wanting to do? And I said, and they'll tell me, and I said, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's just talk until you get over this little feeling. And first of all, I want you to leave where you are right now and go get in your car, you know, and start driving and we'll just put me on speaker and we'll talk, you know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But I've seen so many success stories Good. that come out of that. And it just, it overpowers the ones that aren't. And, you know, and two, the girls can come back to the program. I've seen girls come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, and, but I love them. I love every one of them. Sometimes I can pinch their heads off, you know, but that's <laughs> the same way you are with, they're like my children. I can do that with them too. Yes, yes. They drive you crazy. <laughs> they drive you crazy, but you love them anyway. <laughs> but I do love my girls. And um, I, I, I love that your church actually stepped up and started this program and that you rape, how many women besides you do this? Uh, I don't know how many women are on the board of directors, but all of them are invested, you know, in the lives of the girls. But I have three, what we call moms okay. that work with my group. Right. And so there are four of us and there's usually nine girls. Well, now the girls who I have rules, the only reason you, if you graduate the program, you can continue to come to our meetings that we have once a month, mm -hmm. as long as you're clean. If you're not clean, you can't come. Okay. Now that's, but you have to graduate the program. And I have several who've graduated that continue to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because they just like the fellowship. When they're with a me, it's different than what it is when they're in a group session at the house. Mm -hmm. Because what happens at my table doesn't leave that table. Good. You know, there's, it's safe. If you've got a complaint, if you want to talk about anything, you're safe here. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, can, can we put up a place or a number if uh, somebody was, is out there and in the Arkansas area or anywhere around there, um, for them to, for anyone to contact you if they are, yes. need help? Uh, the best way to contact me is uh, my email. If you have any doubt whatsoever in your mind that you do not have a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to nail it down. 
I spent 30, over 30 years of one year, not just not knowing for sure, but now that I know for sure life has been so much sweeter, so much better than what it ever was before. And you really don't give up anything. You may say, well, I'll have to give up this and this and this if I follow Jesus. You don't really have to give up anything. You want to give it up before it's all over. He doesn't force you to. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing is your reward, your place in heaven is there. And when you look around our world right now, everything that's going on in the United States with this COVID-19, at the riots, everything else, mm -hmm. that's just a tip of the iceberg of what's going to happen during the tribulation. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be here for the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Yes, me neither. And it's yeah. bad enough now to warn you off the Lord, you know, I'm not supposed to be here for this, you know. And he says, Not now, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and no, uh, but you need the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You will never be richer than you will be that second that you do that. He's a life transformer. Everything. He is my without him, I am absolutely nothing.